Hello, Mindshare. My name is Sharon. I'm a science journalist. And tonight, we're going to talk about the neuroscience of love. So specifically, we're going to talk about brain chemicals that are activated when we fall in love and, uh, and how they change over time. OK, so let's start with the basics. What is love? How do we define love? Right, we look to our parents, we look at friends, we read books. But it's very hard to, very, like, in just one phrase, to define what love is. So there's lots of different lenses that we can look through to try to unravel this mystery. We can look through anthropological studies, like the previous speaker. We can um, look through a psychological lens. You know, why is it that you only date women just like your mother kind of thing? Or a spiritual lens, right? Like, where's my soulmate? But tonight, I'm going to talk about the lens of neuroscience to try to help us understand what love is. Um, and understanding the chemicals behind the, these emotions can provide some perspective. Because quite often, these chemical mechanisms evolved back in the dawn of our species, where what were the goals? To populate the Earth as well as increase our genetic variation. So, I mean, those mechanisms clearly work really well, right? We've got seven billion people on the planet, tons of genetic variation. So these mechanisms are frankly not really relevant today anymore. And people are having relationships. Some people want kids, some people don't. People want different things out of their relationships. So, that's why I think that understanding these mechanisms can help you get perspective and then make choices to further along your relationship in the way that you want to go. So the four key chemicals we're going to talk about tonight relate to four mental states that we associate with falling in love. And I break the four down into two phases. Two are in initial love, and then two are in mature love. Dopamine! Woo! Yeah! All right, so the mental state that dopamine elicits is excitement. I mean, look at this guy. So psyched, right? Um, let's meet George. He um, met some girl named Betty at a Mindshare event. <laughs> he thinks Betty's pretty cute. And uh, he got her phone number and asked her out on a text. Hey, you know. <laughs> she waited a couple days to get back to him. So he's, you know, very excited, anticipating the chase is on. She just got back to him. Guess what she said? Yeah, I'll go out with you. Let's do it. So look at this. He's elated, right? So basically, how dopamine works, his brain is flooded with dopamine. It's as, biologically speaking, it's as if he's on cocaine, basically, here. <laughs> so, so essentially, um, dopamine relates to this pleasure-reward pathway. So if you look at the brain here, the ventral tegmental area, the bottom bit, the VTA, receives the stimulation, such as the information on the text, and then rewards him for possibly spreading his genes, right? So you get a reward of this hit of dopamine anytime you do something that will benefit your survival. So flirting boosts dopamine. Um, you know, being excited about a potential prospect boosts dopamine. Um, eating food, dopamine, right? So that's why food not only tastes good, but it also gives you pleasure because you have that flood of dopamine so that you'll keep eating. Um, so now, this pathway here has an addictive nature to it because you see the VTA releases dopamine to the top bit here called the caudate. It's the top of the limbic system. And then the caudate sends a signal back saying, hey, whatever that was, I want more of it. Okay? So, so it's this circuit, and that's where addiction comes in. So anything you think of that has an addictive quality, such as cocaine, nicotine, sugar. Sugar is actually more addictive 
than nicotine. Oh yeah. So all of these things trigger this pathway. Also like adrenaline junkies, same thing. They're, it's more like dopamine junkies. So you can also be addicted to dating. You can be addicted to the chase, addicted to dating one person and the next person because it's, again, it's this pathway. And then one final thing that's interesting is the front of the brain is the prefrontal cortex. And this is where judgment lies. And whenever this pathway is triggered, it also suppresses your judgment. <laughs> We're totally screwed. <laughs> so basically, it's your animal brain, your limbic system, that's in control here. OK, so the second, oh yeah, pretty good, huh? The second chemical related to initial love is phenylethylamine. Say that three times twice, or three times fast. Okay. You guys are good. All right, you can also call it PEA. It's a lot easier. And this is the mental state of lust, sexual desire, obsession, infatuation. Can't stop thinking about this person. When you see them, you just want to eat them up. We know this feeling, right? I personally think of David Beckham when I think of this chemical. <laughs> so if you've ever been in a relationship, you know that it's very high quantity when you first meet, right? It's that honeymoon period, just so elated, just can't wait to hop, hop in the sack, right? But then it gradually decreases over time. But what most people don't realize is that this gradual decrease is actually an evolutionary mechanism to increase genetic variation. <sighs> Let's look at this a little closely. OK, so, so basically, this is the decline of PEA. As you see on the left, um, the, the numbers on the bottom are number of years that you're with your partner. So right at the beginning, you see it's 100% very, very strong PEA. And it's full on for at least six to eight months. And that's the honeymoon period, right? And then it slowly starts to decline over time until it's completely gone, sorry folks, <laughs> between one and a half years to three years. And that's where the two lines related to here. So everyone falls somewhere between one and a half and three years. I know, wah, wah, Debbie Downer. So, <laughs> Um, so basically, again, this is an evolutionary mechanism, and the reason why is because at three years is the amount of time to become attracted, have sex, get pregnant, have the baby, and then the newborn will most likely survive if there's two people involved, right? So they're, they're still, they still got some PEA going on, but once that newborn gets to about a year, two years, they're much more independent. They can contribute to the tribe. They're walking around, you know, baby steps. But they're not as vulnerable or dependent as a brand new newborn. And so therefore, it's beneficial to the species as a whole to fall out of lust and then fall back into lust with someone else so that the whole process happens again. And then their offspring has more genetic variation. Make sense? All right. Hey, but there's good news still to come. Don't worry. OK, so what does this mean? We have two schools of thought here. Does this mean that humans as a species are not meant to be together past the three-year mark? Some people might say that, you know, because they want to stay in that initial love. They define love as, you know, the spark, the fire, the excitement, right? The lust. Um, the second school of thought is, or maybe lust is just the mechanism that brings people together in such an intense way, and that there is something more significant to come. You know, it's up to you. It's not, not like one way is better than the other. OK, so. 
So, um, so basically, we're now at the mature love stage. Um, so basically, how do you keep love alive past that four-year mark? After the, after the, I'm sorry, at the three-year mark when the PEA runs out. So you have this oxytocin, and this is released whenever there's physical touch. So you literally has to be in contact. And oxytocin is not sexual. You can, when you hug your friend, you get that kind of warm, cozy feeling. Oh, you're the best. And what that, feel, what that is, is you're being bonded. You're feeling a bond or a connection with this other person. Um, so once again, it has to be physical touch. And this is a reason why long distance relationships don't always work out, because they don't have that constant stream of oxytocin. Um, so again, to keep that love alive past the PEA, you got you to gotta hug, you got to cuddle, you got to massage, <laughs> cuddle puddles, right? <laughs> Whenever I think of a cuddle puddle, I think of a huge Petri dish just swimming in oxytocin. That's what I think of. So, um, okay, so orgasm releases a whole lot of oxytocin. Um, both in men and women after they're already in love. However, there is one slight difference before they have fallen in love. So let's say, let's say, you know, George and Betty, they had a great date. PEA was flying, and they went home, you know, and had some sex. Okay, so the next morning, Betty wakes up and says, oh, I've met the love of my life, right? I feel so bonded to George, because look at her oxytocin levels, sky high, okay? Before, after, the before is yellow, the after is blue. So basically, the evolutionary reason for this is, you know, this guy's gonna be the father of your child. You don't wanna just kick him to the curb, right? Let's have some bonding here. Um, so she's also increased her excitement level a little bit. So now for men, George over here, he, he got some oxytocin, yeah. But, you know, he was really excited before the date, right? Because he's all about that excitement uh, dopamine increases with the chase. But now look at his dopamine level after sex. <laughs> you know, the chase is over. And, <laughs> and so basically, you know, this is not like a pro or con, should you do casual sex or not. This is more just, if you are going to embark on this, just know what you're getting into. <laughs> And I also want to say that once, let's say George gave Betty another shot. She, he's like, you know what, she was really cool. And they, they keep going out. George falls in love with Betty. Suddenly, months into it, his oxytocin also goes sky high when they have sex. So there you go. There is that close bonding. OK, so the final, the fourth uh, chemical we're going to talk about is serotonin. And again, this is part of the mature love. This is a feeling of well-being feeling of contentment, ease, going through life as a partnership, you're with your best friend whom you trust completely. Um, and again, so at this three to four year mark, the, the, this is when you transfer from initial love to mature love. And so your PEA and dopamine start to drop as your oxytocin and serotonin levels have arisen. And so, there are studies about divorces. They say that the highest divorce rate is at the four-year mark. So again, that's a year after the PEA has run out, right? And but see, what's so sad about that is that, you know, you're sitting there four years in, and you look at your beloved, and you're like, I don't love you anymore, right? But they haven't changed. They're still that wonderful person you fell in love with, right? It's just, but knowing this information about this evolutionary mechanism, you can possibly override that and say, you know what, let's, let's not worry about that and let's maybe focus on the oxytocin, the serotonin component. Because, <laughs> just being optimistic. 
So, so basically, the studies also show that, as I said, the four-year mark is the highest level for divorce, but if the couples can get over that bump in the road, you know, couples always say, oh, we had a rocky few years, right? Whether they get through that, they actually stabilize. Because oxytocin and serotonin increase so much that they've now redefined what love is, right? It's not, you know, fiery and sexy, but, you know, it's about bonding and feeling well-being. Um, so there, there's one little thing, just naturally dopamine levels decrease as serotonin levels increase, right? Because serotonin is about ease and dopamine is excitement, right? But we want it all here at Mindshare, don't we? Yep. Right? Oh, I got something for you. Okay, can we have both well-being and excitement? And the answer is an emphatic yes! Woo! So basically, even though the PEA is gone, and you, you know, you're harnessing that well-being and that bonding feeling, you can still generate dopamine by you know, having date nights and going on adventures together and being romantic. So look at these guys, right? George and Betty, they made it, right? I mean, okay, so my final slide here is just a basic question. Where are you on your journey of love? Right? Are, you, are you waiting in the dopamine pool, you know, just dating here and there? It's very exciting. Are you having some hot and getting hot and heavy with someone? Oh. Uh, are you feeling a lot of oxytocin and kind of general love for all your friends and life? Or are you feeling that sense of serotonin well-being you're with your best friend? So the idea here, once again, just to wrap up, take home message, that just through, the, it's, it's important to keep this information in mind as you're moving through this journey because one day, one of these chemicals are just going to hit you, right? <laughs> right? And so you can stop and think, you know, is this emotion, is it helpful in my situation? Is it actually relevant to my situation? Or is this some pesky evolutionary mechanism that's just trying to trick me, right? So, so the point is that you can have this higher awareness, this understanding, so you can choose consciously who you want to be in your romantic relationships rather than have your chemicals run the show. Thank you very much.